One of the distinguishing aspects of the programs we offer here in the College of Design, Construction, and Planning is the rich variety of opportunities our students have to secure part of their disciplinary training through global engagement. The College's Study Abroad program exposes our students to the challenges and opportunities to many cultures and on every continent. One of our newest international connections is with one of our Indonesia's premier universities, the University of Indonesia, located in Jakarta, Indonesia. We are honored to have as guest today the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Indonesia, Dr. Bambang Sugiyarto, and four department heads, Dr. Harinaldo, Dr. Asfiel, Dr. Kuniawan, and Dr. Purwanto. Would you please stand so we can extend a warm Gator welcome to you. Indonesia is a very special place for me. On three separate occasions, beginning in October 1989 and encompassing a total of nearly four years, the Silver family, my family, all four of us, lived, studied, worked, and played in Indonesia, the world's fourth, fourth most populous country, a place in some ways very different from the United States, but yet in so many ways sharing values and aspirations very familiar to us. Indonesia inspired us in its celebration of the values associated with community, in its creation of a single nation out of so much diversity, and most recently, in its most successful transition to a model of democracy in Southeast Asia. We are so honored today to have Dr. Dino Pati Jalau, Ambassador to the United States from the Republic of Indonesia as our commencement speaker. As you can read in the biographical sketch contained in the commencement program, Dr. Jalal had extensive experience in North America long before he assumed the prestigious post of ambassador to the United States, especially through his education in two leading Canadian universities and then his doctorate from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Actually, I remember him telling a gathering of academics in D.C. several years ago that he attended high school in Northern Virginia when his family was stationed there years earlier. Dr. Jalal has amassed a distinguished career as a diplomat, a best-selling author, as a public spokesperson for the current president of Indonesia, Susilo Bambang Yudhiono, and in leadership positions with global organizations such as the Institute for Peace and Democracy, the Indonesian Council on World Affairs, and the World Resources Institute. Dr. Jalau was accompanied here to Gainesville today by his chief education advisor, Dr. Hario Winarso, who also is a long-standing friend of mine from Indonesia, the Indonesian consulate at Houston, Pat Budi, and Mr. Fedi Adrianto, third secretary to the Embassy of Indonesia in DC. Please stand and be, get your warm Gator welcome. It is a sincere privilege to have Dr. Jalal as DCP's Spring 2013 commencement speaker. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Jalal. Dean Professor Christopher Silver, fellow visiting professors and dean from the University of Indonesia, faculty members, students and parents. It's great to be here in Gainesville. I've come from Washington, D.C., where I'm based as Indonesia's ambassador to the United States. And I want to thank America for teaching me a new English word, which as a second English language speaker, I've never heard of before, which is sequestration. <laughs> when, when, when I first heard the term, I thought it was some kind of painful medical procedure. It turned out I wasn't far off. <laughs> so how does it feel to graduate from the best university in this country? Good. Now get a job. Congratulations to all of you, class of 2013. This is your day. Breathe every second of it. All those sleepless nights studying, all those research papers, 
All those beers finally paid off today. <laughs> Disneyland, here we come. And congratulations to the proud families who are here today, especially the happy parents. I imagine the parents must be so excited with the thought that they are no longer responsible for financing their children. <laughs> well, think again. <laughs> Mom and dad, more bills are coming. And don't start ordering that new kitchen set yet. The good news is that after today, the class of 2013 will be able to flash a new badge to the world. Badge that says, David Wasserman BS, Amy Cavaretta MA, courtesy of University of Florida, and I hope you wear it proudly. Consider it your ticket to what is bound to be the most remarkable century ever known to humankind. Some of you may feel nervous about the world that awaits you out there, a world where nothing is certain, where you get fired for making mistakes, where they don't know your name. Well, if you, are, if you are apprehensive, my advice is this, don't be. I recently came across an eye-opening international survey on how young people in different countries see the world. They were asked questions such as what they think of globalization. Well, this might surprise you as it did me. In India, 89% of the youth said they like globalization because it is an asset for their future. In Brazil, 81%. Japan, 75%. South Africa, 77% said they are encouraged by globalization. Mexico, 73%. Sweden, 76%. You see all around the world, more and more young people see the world not as something to fear, to avoid, but as a sea of opportunity, a promising place to make a living. You are among them. From what I see today, your numbers can be well over 80 or 90% in seeing the world as a place of opportunity. You must believe it in your heart that engaging the world makes you better, stronger, and smarter. For there is a brave new world upon you. It is an unusual world where there are more entrepreneurs in communist China than in capitalist America, where the richest man in the world is Mexican, and where the country with the highest economic growth in the world is Ghana. And unlike your parents' world, this brave new world has remarkable features. It is marked by stable relationship among the major powers, a rare occasion in world affairs. It has the most number of democracies and open societies in the international system ever recorded. It is marked by the proliferation of emerging economies and phenomenal growth of middle class worldwide. It is producing many creative explosions and multiculturalism is thriving as an international norm. I call this age the age of possibility and opportunity. You are poised to be a child and hopefully the master of this era. Chances are you have no recollection of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, the Berlin War, apartheid. You have no first-hand memory of the cruelties of the 20th century. And you are forgiven if you think Nikita Khrushchev is a supermodel. You are born without baggages from the past, and you are free to be as forward-looking as you wish in your thinking. I don't know if you realize it, but you are a very special generation, and you can potentially be the best generation. Compared to previous generations, you are the most connected, the most open, the most free, the most liberated, the most documented, the most exposed, the most egalitarian, the most emancipated, the most talented, the most wealthy, and the most resourceful generation ever. No other generation in the past have the tools that you have at your disposal today. So the question is this, what will you do with all this? Where will you take us 
And what will you change beyond your new credentials today? Will you be the generation that can spread progress, cure cancer, kill hatred, resolve conflicts, end poverty, defeat corruption, roll back extremism, and wipe out ignorance? Or will you bury your head in the sand? And if you do, that will be a great shame. For you are the generation with the most power and most capacity to change the world for the better. You know, this became ever more clear to me when I saw a young kid named Joshua Williams speak at the Young President's Organization Conference in Colorado. And when they asked me to watch him, I said, what could a 10-year-old kid do or say? And I was pleasantly surprised with the answer. You probably have heard of him. Joshua was five years old when he began collecting food for the poor and the homeless in Miami. Before he reached 10 years old, he had already fed 7,000 people with 400,000 pounds of food. If a young kid can feed 7,000 homeless people, imagine what all of you grown-ups can do with all your knowledge and resources. I totally believe that all the individuals, families, companies, NGOs, and activists in the world collectively can produce a lot more good and deliver a lot more change than all the work of the governments and the United States, the United Nations combined. I would even go further by saying that there's a new superpower emerging apart from the United States. It's not China, it's not Russia, it's not Brazil, it's not India. The superpower is the youth. And the youth demonstrated their enormous power recently when they brought down powerful governments in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Libya, something which no other force in the world could do. And in more ways than you realize, you are part of that youth superpower. But the sad news is in many parts of the world, there are millions of young people who for a variety of reasons are becoming restless, desperate, and marginalized. And in that process, they become narrow-minded, inward-looking, and xenophobic. Where others see a world of opportunity, they are driven by fear. Some are becoming radicalized and moving against the tide of history. We're already seeing some collisions between these different forces. There is a battle for your soul out there. And in this battle that is happening worldwide, you will be pulled in so many different directions and you will be asked to vouch for ideas, many of which belong to the past. My suggestion to you is this, take your time, Try to find your own answers, your own solutions, solutions that make sense for your time and your needs. Do not be wedded to an idea unless you have really thought it through. Avoid being dogmatic because the 21st century belongs to those who are open-minded and can constantly adopt. As you make your next move in this brave new world, let me give you a few advice. But I should let you know beforehand that I began my work at the embassy in Washington, D.C., where I'm now ambassador as a dishwasher, not a joke, dishwasher in 1981. So what I'm about to tell you very much reflects what I have learned in life and at work that has helped me climb up from being dishwasher to becoming ambassador of the world's fourth largest country. The first thing you must remember is that the most important currency in the world is not the US dollar, it's not the Japanese yen, the Chinese yuan, or Mexican pesos. The world's most important currency is your skill. When you apply for a job, just like when you apply to this great University of Florida, they will not ask you if you are a Christian or Muslim, a Hindu or a Buddhist. They will not care if you're white, black, pink, green, or yellow. They will not notice if you have a funny accent like me or if you wear a skirt or a suit, but they will ask you what degrees you have. Your grade point average from which university, how many languages you speak, what papers have you produced, your problem-solving skills, and your special academic and professional talents. 
there is a fierce global competition for talent underway. It is a talent market out there. You can dictate your terms. And your skill and knowledge is what defines you in the job market. The worst that you can do is to relax in your comfort zone. Like any currency, your skills too can appreciate and depreciate. So you must always renew them. Second, it is not money that makes the world go around. It is relationships. If you look closely, history is not made just by great men and women, not just by great ideas, but by great relationships between Roosevelt and Churchill, between Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, Romeo and Juliet. Don't be surprised if you see people with less talents make it to the top because they have better relationships. Relationships are the greatest source of opportunities and they are the key to success. And most importantly, good relationships will make you a better person. You know, my favorite comic book superhero is Rogue from X-Men characters. You may know her. Why? Because Rogue has the ability to absorb the power of any other superheroes. And with my limited academic credentials, this is what I have done all throughout my life, to find mentors and extraordinary people and learn from them. And there's never any shortage of them. Your relationships will make you richer, stronger, and wiser. But life has also taught me this. No matter how many new friends and mentors and colleagues you make, they should never be at the expense of your relationship with your family. There is no greater love, no greater support or loyalty than the ones coming from your mom and dad, brother and sister. When they say, I love you, it is the most genuine thing on earth. And it means they will always stand by you no matter what. So let's give them our big love. Third, do not overlook the small things, for they may lead to big things. For me, that small thing was a two-second chance encounter that took place in Singapore. I had just checked into a hotel room and decided to go to the elevator where the door was closing. I yelled, wait up, and a hand came out from the inside of the elevator to reopen it. I walked in and there was a the man that I knew. He chatted with me and he asked me to help him write a speech that he was delivering the next day, which I did even though I had my own speech to write that evening. The speech was a relative success. He liked it and we became close friends. Some years later, he became president of Indonesia. He asked me to be his foreign policy advisor and then ambassador to the United States. If I had missed that two seconds of elevator door closing, the whole chain of opportunities would have disappeared as well. So never underestimate the smallest event for they can bring great things to your love, to your life. Fourth, as the wise Dalai Lama point out, sometimes not getting what you want is a wonderful stroke of luck. I guarantee you this you will encounter a series of disappointments in your life. You will not always get the job you wanted, the promotion you sought, the rewards you craved for. Even the woman or man of your dreams may turn you down. But life works in mysterious ways. God looks out for you. And I have discovered all too often in my life and career, failure and setbacks can lead to new opportunities and even better path and better future. The key is to be patient, to be constantly introspective, to be persistent, and to always believe in yourself. Fifth, keep your idealism, but employ pragmatism. I left the safe comfort of university life to join diplomacy in 1986. I was 21 years old, beaming with idealism, but I soon discovered a harsh world. My values were frequently torn apart. I saw corruption, greed, 
human rights violation, abuse of power, authoritarianism. It was all a sobering experience, but it made me understand how the world worked and how to change it bit by bit. I stayed in government because I believe I could change things from the inside. And I stayed on no matter what was boiling inside of me because I believe politics is not evil. Politics is the eternal battle between good and bad, and the good must always prevail. And as a diplomat, I began to learn to temper my idealism with pragmatism. I began to accept that I could not win all the battles, and sometimes compromises have to be made. I learned to make one step backward to make two steps forward. And I learned that although I could not change the whole world, I could change the many small things that were happening around me. As a result, I was fortunate enough to be part of policy processes that produce historic decisions. Decisions that brought peace to the bloody conflict in Aceh, safe tropical rainforests in Indonesia, safe lives during the great Indian Ocean tsunami of 2005, decisions that bridged between the Islamic and Western worlds, decisions that strengthened relations between Indonesia and the United States. My name was never printed in any of these agreements, but this was never about personal credit. Having some part in them is good enough for me. I appeal to the class of 2013 to cling as much as possible to your idealism, because you know what? More often than not, idealism can fade away. And this is important to keep in mind because what the world needs is not more nationalism, but more idealism. There's plenty of nationalism going around everywhere, but not enough compassion and certainly not enough globalism. Finally, class of 2013, I always remember that the real strength, the real strength come from within. It will be too easy for you to get lost in the outside world. The world may have become smaller, a small village, some would say, but it is still an enormous place for me and for you. There are so many things to do, so many people to meet, so many places to see, so much wealth to be made. The world is moving so fast, there's good possibility that you will be dis disoriented. Well, let me tell you now that chasing the world is a never-ending process and will leave you exhausted. No amount of money can guarantee your personal happiness, and there are plenty of billionaires who feel empty inside. And I know this because some of them are my friends and they have told me so. The biggest and most important space you need to fill is inside yourself. And once you find that space, occupy it and fill it with your faith in God, with love and kindness, with wisdom, with a giving spirit, with service to others. My father told me that the secret to inner happiness is to live a life of simplicity. He is 80 years old today, and despite all his material wealth, he has kept his life simple. And that simplicity has kept him solid, content, and well-balanced. And I've been trying to adopt that as well. So for whatever it's worth, these are my dishwasher six points of wisdom for the class of 2013 of the College of Design, Construction, and Planning. I hope there will be a time when you will encounter events in your life that will remind you of these lessons. But I want to end with something that has helped me sustain me in difficult moments. It came from my college friend and former roommate, Michael Carlo from New York. Our families were very close friends. After college, he moved on to become a fireman. And 12 years ago, on September 11th, without hesitation, he moved into the Twin Towers in New York after they were hit by terrorist attacks. His body was never found again. But his mother, Phyllis Carlo, did find a note on his desk in his room, and she shared it with Michael's friends, including with me. When I returned to America as ambassador in 2010, I paid a visit to Michael's memorial that had written the quote from that note on his stone. It is the same quote that have given me strength in the last decade. Let me share that quote. 
and it is from Mark Twain. Life is short, break the rules, forgive quickly, kiss slowly, laugh uncontrollably, and never regret anything that made you smile. 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than the ones you did. So throw off the bowlines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. Class of 2013, go catch your dream, sail away, explore, and discover. Thank you. Ambassador Jalal, for your, we want to thank you for sharing your remarks today in this most important day, inspiring. We have a small memento as a token of our appreciation, so you remember this day. We'll remember it for sure.